Um, I'm, I'm sure you have a read on my book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome you here. My name is Judy Byer, and I'm the Adult Program Coordinator here at the Waterbury Public Library. And it's my pleasure to have wonderful programs like the one Jurette's going to be presenting, Reclaiming Our Lost Selves. And Jurette knows the subject. She was part of a cult for 18 years and wrote this wonderful book, An Everyday Cult. Cults exist everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and they fly under the radar, most of them. They're not the biggies like the Jim Jones and the others that we know about. I mean, those are certainly the you know, notorious ones, but there's so many that there's, a, um, there's an imbalance of power and, um, and there is a loss of self, as you rightly put in your presentation. So um, I'm excited. Dred has these books. We also have them at the library. I purchased some for this series that Jurette is doing. And so I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can introduce yourself in a greater uh, manner or go deeper into your background a little bit, but I just wanted to say welcome everybody and glad you're all here. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And I'm glad, so glad that you're here uh, this evening. And um, welcome to whoever sees this at a later time. Um, I want to start with a statement that was actually written not by myself. And it's, we're obsessed with cults. It's the zeitgeist of our current culture. And I'm curious if you agree with that statement that we're obsessed with cults and it's the zeitgeist of our current culture today. Does that statement resonate with you? This is not a test, this is just, I'm curious if indeed that, that sounds accurate or not. And I would like you to explain zeitgeist. I know it and I always have to say which one is which, spirit and... Um... I actually don't know. Oh, okay, so you <laughs> nodded, so you know what it means. The zeitgeist, what I understand the zeitgeist is, and we might have to uh, pull up a dictionary to, um, to double check me, um, but the zeitgeist is the, the um, yeah, the, the cultural and uh, wide, um, how I understand it at any rate. So here I am like flubbing at the very first word. I didn't even think to look it up. So. Truth is, I'm going to stop talking about that word because <laughs> I will probably screw it up. Um, maybe the when I what I think of when I hear that statement, which is actually written in my book, it's in the the forward of my book, written by um, Sarah Edmondson, who was a key whistleblower of the Nixium uh, cult. <clears throat> um, what I think of with that piece is. What's happening today in terms of this plethora of um, documentaries, document, docu, docu series? You know, the, uh, they're all over the place on HBO and Netflix and Amazon Prime and Stars, and so many um, memoirs are coming out. It's on the news. These cultic terms are in the news all the time. And there's a lot of mudslinging that goes on between the, the in political spheres, between the right and the left, throwing these terms um, kind of against that in an accusatory way at each other. So these cultic terms are um, prevalent today in a way that they were not when I got out of the group that I was a part of for 18 years, um, I got out nine years ago. So it's a more recent phenomenon um, that, that it has, that these topics have really come into the, you know, the public discourse. Um, I find it terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely, whether I know the technical definition of the word. Of zeitgeist or not. Um, yeah. And I didn't know how to spell it, so I couldn't look it up. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I find yeah. it really, really disturbing because I find it all 
around, and we won't even have a political discussion. Um, exactly, exactly, and and I think that that is, I think that reality is is true that there that there is this. It's like risen up um, in these last, you know, four, six, eight years. Um, certainly, the last six years. So, for this evening, zeitgeist, um, um, yeah, the defining spirit or mood of a particular period of history, is shown by the ideas and benefits, uh, beliefs of the time. So you're spot That's on. It. I was yeah. just thinking, oh, I know it's German. Which one is which? You yeah. know, and I was okay. thinking technically of the specific parts yeah. of the word, but. So how do you spell it? Uh, Z-E-I-T, Geist is G-E-I-S-T, yeah. Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. Yeah, I would have been here a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm hoping to cover this evening, if, um, if you had looked at the poster that went out about the, tonight's event, um, there were four questions that were to be explored. Um, the first one is, what is coercive control and undue influence? So we're going to be looking at that first. Um, how, the second question is, how does indoctrination occur? So what is that process where a person becomes indoctrinated into a cultic narrative? Third question is, who is vulnerable to these dynamics? And the fourth question is, like kind of a basic question that to me is probably the most important is why is it important to understand this and how can, when I say this, I mean these dynamics and how can an understanding of these dynamics actually contribute to making more resilient communities and neighborhoods and families. Um, so I'm hoping that that's what you're wanting to hear this evening, because that's what I'm prepared to share. Um, and before we dive into that, I have to tell you about my Uncle Joe. I send this newsletter out every uh, couple times a month. And Uncle Joe, beloved, beloved uncle, um, almost every single newsletter, he sends back some sort of an email and um, has various quips and stories and um, ideas. Just a few days ago, he sent me this, and I, I, I'm going to read it to you because I, I have to make sure that I'm quoting Uncle Joe correctly. He said, so Jurette, I have a question. What drives us to seek out things like cults? What are we seeking? What do we think we'll find? And why wouldn't having a popsicle do as well? <laughs> so there's the humor of Uncle Joe, and we might find that there's actually um, a little bit of wisdom in his question as well. So looking at the issue of undue influence, that's our first question, coercive control and undue influence. Undue influence, we can't really look at without first acknowledging influence. And influence is something that we experience as human beings from the very moment of our birth all the way through our lives until our last dying breaths. We are a profoundly social species. We we influence each other just by our mere presence. Those of us in this room tonight are influencing each other to one degree or another. And you know, this we, we walk into a store, we're being influenced. We walk into the library. I was just walking from the bathroom to this room, and there was a book that caught my eye, my father's words. Like, oh, that caught me. I was influenced by that uh, title, and I had to pick it up. So we're influenced all the time for better and for worse. And undue influence is definitely an example of the for worse guide. We typically think and hear about undue influence in the realm of elder abuse. And um, 
Oops. Um, what happens with undue influence is when an individual steps in and usurps the will of another person. And that person will make decisions on their behalf without their consent. So the not having their consent is a big part of uh, what undue influence is. In the American Bar Association, there are laws. It is illegal. Uh, undue influence is illegal. Um, uh, they state on the American Bar Association that undue influence is difficult to legislate. For example, an elder has a legal right to spend money on telemarketers, even if it jeopardizes their financial stability and even their ability to survive. The um, American Bar Association goes on to say, undue influence takes place behind closed doors and there are no witnesses. It's often linked to impaired cognitive ability. Complicating things further, undue influence is present in many different circumstances hostage situations, families, domestic violence, prisoners of war, cults, and white collar crime. It could even apply, that is undue influence could even apply, to totalitarian regimes that control populations because their elements are similar. I see some nodding heads. So that's a little nugget of undue influence. So now let's turn our um, focus to coercive control. Coercive control is a very complex like, pattern of, of controls that are specifically designed to intimidate, to isolate, to manipulate, and control a person or a group. Take note, my friends. There is nothing in the American Bar Association about coercive control because it is not illegal. There are many countries that have laws on coercive control. We now have a few states in the United States that, are, that have some laws in place but very few. There are some where it's kind of in the making and a, or in, in process, but you know how long it can take to get things um, moving in laws. Um, so the definition for coercive control that I'm gonna share with you tonight comes from England. And I really look forward to the day when I can read to you the legal definition of coercive control that is understood here in the United States. Because it is so needed. There is so much harm that has been done because we do not, there are so many, there are so many people who we are unable to prosecute because we don't have this legislation. Cult leaders are notoriously difficult to prosecute. And this is why. Later we could talk, well maybe I'll just say it right now. There, there is recent, um, the, the, the trial of Keith Raniere, who is the, um, the ex-leader of Nixium, the cult in Albany, New York. Um, he's now in jail for 120 years. The, the prosecutor who carried that case is a brilliant, brilliant lawyer named Moira Penza. And what she did to get him in jail was she actually looked at um, how uh, crime rings work. And she applied that model and the way that coercion is used in those, in those settings and applied it to this cultic group. And she got him. So it was human trafficking, um, labor trafficking, um, 
those were the, the main things. There was a whole bunch of other um, issues. But, um, and her, her legislation, her work has really, um, is now starting to change um, the, the climate because uh, the, the uh, trial of, um, um, hi, come on in. It's no worries. No worries that you're late. Come in. Um, you're not late, you're right on time. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, um, the trial of R. Kelly, or, am I saying his name right? The uh, rapper? Yes. That was also based on um, the, the work of Moira Penza, who was the lawyer who tried Keith Raniere and got him tried. So at any rate, as I said, I do really look forward to someday being able to read the United States definition of coercive control. We don't have that yet. So here is the definition that comes from England. Coercive control is a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation, and intimidation, or other abuse that is used to harm, punish, or frighten their victim. This controlling behavior is designed, designed to make a person dependent by isolating them from support, exploiting them, depriving them of independence, and regulating their everyday behavior. We need, really need, legislation to hold people accountable to these, this egregious behavior. There's a, an expert um, also from the UK um, that states, I, I appreciated some of his, um, I had read some of his work, um, and this is just a quote from him. He says, the victim of coercive control becomes captive in an unreal world created by the abuser, entrapped in a world of confusion, contradiction, and fear. And my friends, coercive control and undue influence exists in controlling groups of all kinds. When I use the term controlling groups, we're talking about things that you might, you know, in your mind think about as cults, but controlling groups um, is, a, is a phrase that I tend to use that encompasses everything from controlling religions to um, uh, corporate environments or labor or work environments that are exploitive to um, even, you know, it, it can exist in, in the arena of sports. It can exist in the whole, you know, we've certainly heard of many different yoga cults that have come up over, you know, been, uh, come out in the news recently. Um, so the whole wellness community, uh, self-help therapy groups. Um, so the, wherever there are controls, that have some of these elements that we just explored in undue, influ undue influence and coercive control. Um, so I want to just shift to um, Uncle Joe's, one of Uncle Joe's questions, which is like, what, what are we seeking? What are they seeking when people go into these controlling groups? Well, first off, Anyone that goes into those groups has no idea that there's control present. So that's really important to understand. You can go into them. I went into the group that I was in for 18 years as a full, able, you know, educated, mature adult. And the, the process of becoming indoctrinated, which is now our second but what question. were you seeking? So what I was seeking, which was Uncle Joe's question, was um, a kind of idealism. The single most common trait, character trait, that uh, people who exit controlling groups have, we're all idealists. 
in one way or another. We want a better world. We want a better self. We want a better relationship. We want, you know, a better town, whatever it might be. We want a better relationship to the, you know, to God or to our higher power. Um, it is, but, you know, classically, every single um, study that has been done, kind of trying to understand who's vulnerable to cultic influence, you know, idealism again and again comes up at the very top of the list. I'm still an idealist. Am I, more, am I more of a realist now? You betcha. I had perhaps, well not perhaps, but definitely ungrounded realism when I got involved. But, but in that kind of seeking, um, I was seeking a better self. I, I mean, in a certain way, I was seeking all of those things. But in my, in my quest, to, to be, to get involved in this group, I wanted to know myself better. I felt there were certain ways that I was held back, that I was restricted in my life. And I wanted, I believed that there was more possible. And, you know, I was, I was right. I was met with, in the group that I was involved with, there were some very, very good things. I did grow. I did learn. Getting into this, in the first stage of how we become in, indoctrinated, um, the very early stages have to do with focusing on this kind of idealism and also what we fondly call um, love bombing in the cult recovery space. Um, and love bombing is when, I'll give you an example from a, from a cult that is, um, has been really identified, um, is global. They're all over, all over Europe. There are several in Vermont. They're in um, New England, uh, Boulder, Colorado, California. It's a group called the 12 Tribes. And this, when you go into, well, one of the things that this group uses is a cafe. And so you can go in and get your a nice lunch. The food is spectacular. The food is really delicious. The, um, you, every single one of these, they're called yellow delis. Every single one of these environments, the cafes have handcrafted woodwork, friendly people delicious smells. You know, you're there, you want to be there, and it feels great. You have a great meal, you go back another time, you get to know the people, you get curious about them. So another, after love bombing, comes um, a, a condition or a principle that is discussed in this book, Influence, this is um, a new edition of this book um, by Robert Cialdini, The Psychology of Persuasion. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. Has nothing to do with cults, but everything to do with cults. Um, and he talks in that book, one of the key principles he talks about is called reciprocation. And we naturally, when someone gives us something, there is a natural tendency to want to give back. And when we give back, we tend to give way more. We over give. So the next step that this group that I was just mentioning, once, you're, once they get to know you at the cafe, um, they'll invite you to a dinner. They'll be like, oh, there's a, we have an evening event. Come for dinner. And you already know how good the food is. So you're like, sign me up. I'm in. Let's have a dinner. And you know, they'll mention that, OK, yeah, there's, you know, we'll have a little, um, they may or may not mention a prayer circle. You know, I don't know their specific rap, to be honest. Um, so they may or may not mention, but, but the person will know that there'll be a little something about their group that's going to happen, too. 
So there you are, you have a wonderful meal that's just as delicious as at the cafe. And then the next part of the evening starts, you've received a free meal. What do you feel? Are you going to walk away from the free meal, meal and say, see you later? No. 90%, maybe more, of people will stay for the whole evening. And those evenings are finely crafted events. And really, you are the meal. You are especially dessert. Because they, they cater it. They will specifically know things. That, where this works the best is when you've been in, in a place, and this is universal. It's not just this one group I'm mentioning. Um, it's, it's universal. Like They will understand things about you. So then the little lecture that takes place that evening will have something that you've shared about your personal life. Maybe you're having trouble with your kids at home and you have a teenager. So there'll be something specifically catered to you and your needs. And voila, you feel met. And you agree to go to the next one. When I started with my teacher, my ex-teacher, um, there's a, um, I, I, I could hear like the, fur, the things that he was saying. He was sharing things that were truthful, that were factual, and were helpful. And those three things, are really important. You hear that, and I'm nodding my head and saying, yeah. And so now I'm going to tell you about the gotcha formula. <laughs> because A is when someone shares something that's truthful, factual, and helpful, and we nod our heads. Um, and then they might share something that is A, you know, a little bit of A, but also a little bit of B, which is a falsehood, something that could be potentially harmful or undermining or, um, or exploitive in one way or another, subtly. And you could also call it BS. So the B, a little bit of B gets woven into the A. And because you were, I was nodding my head at the A when I heard the next bit of information with just a little bit of, you know, mostly A and a little bit of B, I'm still nodding my head, you know? And then the next class I go to, there's, you know, a little bit more B, and yet I'm still nodding my head. And then you get to the point that years later, oh, there's a whole lot of B and very little A, but I'm still nodding my head, saying yes. So that's the gotcha formula. So that, that, um, I named it, but a good friend of mine who was in a, for many years in um, a high-level uh, corporate environment, large corporation, he's the one that shared with me that phenomenon. And I'm like, yes, that's it. So I named it, but it's but I have to give a, a tribute to Casey for that. Pixie. Oh, no! In that, in a, um, I understand why a political person would want to do that. I I don't understand why. Um, in your situation, what do they want? What is what is the game plan? What is the as in what, what does the leader want? Exactly. Yeah. And what is the benefit? What it, so the benefit the benefit ultimately I think really has to do with um, feeding the ego. So it really the is wallet. nothing more complicated than money. Money and ego. Um, and you know, certainly, uh, 
narcissistic personality type. Type. I've never met a cult leader who's not on that spectrum somewhere. Um, and some are extreme, like we talked about Keith Ranieri earlier. Um, I would say that the, the leader of the group that I was a part of was not high on that extreme. He was, you know, definitely on that spectrum, you know, the narcissistic personality uh, type spectrum. Um, <clears throat> but compared to some, I'd say he's, you know, maybe halfway. He was kind of a bad cult leader. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yet still effective. So, he still got me. He still got me. Eighteen years worth. Yeah. <clears throat> and a lot of my money. And it is kind of devastating. So another another principle here, and I do want to just keep aware of. Don't uh, worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I have power. Okay. You've got power. That so, means we can run late. <laughs> great. Um, the uh, another another principle uh, that I'll talk about that comes from this same um, influence book. Who is, is the um, Robert Cialdini. Can you Robert Ross, last name? C A I C. Sorry, I always do that. C I A L D I N I. Okay, thank you. C I A L D I N I. Robert. <coughs> Truly brilliant. Brilliant man. Um, he also talks about the authority principle. So, um, if you uh, if you have a white uh, lab coat on, the simple act of having that lab coat commands a certain kind of respect. You know, you walk into, you walk into a doctor's office and there is, there is a, uh, a power differential. So in these kinds of groups, there's also, you know, this kind of, you know, giving, put, putting an authority on a kind of pedestal. And another principle, and I, and we could talk, we could talk the whole night about authority. We could talk the whole night about any one of these principles, but I'm going to like try to get through the whole, uh, the ones that I picked out to share this evening. Um, another one is the scarcity principle, and that can be used very often. The, the way that it was used in the group I was a part of, it's like, oh, there's only a couple more spots left in the retreat. You know, so you're kind of, I mean, it's classic sales. Marketing. Yeah, it's marketing. It's marketing 101. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so yes, say. you're inclined to, you know, kind of <clears throat> sign up. Or only, you know, there's only going to be three people who will be chosen to do this specific task. You know, and you want to be the one who, who will be chosen because there's only a few spots. But related to the scarcity principle is another one um, called loss aversion. And that is actually far more motivating than the scarcity principle. Loss aversion is when we want to hold on to what we have. And the fear of losing that galvanizes us to, you know, to dig in and fight. Fight for what we have. We don't want to lose what we have. A way that I recently had this aha, um, like literally yesterday, mm -hmm. an aha about loss aversion in relation to um, many groups have a kind of persecution narrative. So that whoever, anyone that is outside of the, the group, um, is actually has a specific intention to, or not, I shouldn't say anyone that's outside the group, but certain populations of people who are outside the group are, are actually, you know, designed to, and is it okay to say hell-bent mm -hmm. on, sorry, you can bleep that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I promise I won't do it again. I'll make an note in the production notes for the editor. <laughs> and it's going to sound weird to say bent. <laughs> no, no. We'll say that they are driven 
to, you know, to persecute the group that you're a part of. And that idea, this, this happens very strongly in um, the far Christian right. There's a very strong persecution narrative that exists. And there's a whole lot we could, we could do a, we could spend a week, you know, on just that topic. But I just, you know, realizing that the persecution narrative is an example of loss aversion. And if there's this idea that your, your beautiful, beloved group could be compromised or threatened in any way, it galvanizes you to dig deep and hold strong and hold fast. So what's the other ones? I just better look at my notes so I don't get too off track. Yes, there's another one which is kind of my favorite that I wanted to share with you. When I first got out of the group that I was involved in, nine years ago was when I got out, um, for some reason, I don't know, I must have heard something on the radio, or I don't even know how I found out about it. But the work of Dr. Dan, uh, Daniel Kenneman, this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, landed, I mean, I ordered it, and um, it is a fascinating book in relation to healing from cultic abuse. Because he describes that we have not one, but two distinctly different systems of thought. So the way, that, the way that our mind operates, we have a fast way of thinking and a slow way of thinking. The thinking fast in our, in our own minds and psyches happens um, with, uh, it's basically a survival, we're working on survival. Um, it's really how we go through the day. Our, our days are automatic. Anything that we can do you know, easily and automatically, we're working on that fast system of thought. Having hunches, we're driving a car, um, you know, a ball comes at us, you know, we know to swerve. Um, the slow system of thought, however, we only have access to the slow system of thinking when we consciously call on it. Otherwise, she's not coming out. So we have to pause. We have to engage very consciously. And then our critical thinking and discernment and far greater accuracy can we have access to that in our, in our thinking. In a controlled environment, guess what, folks? There's no time for that pause. You are constantly kept on the move. There is always something to be done. And, and so you're constantly um, you know, having to get to prayer service, or you know, uh, clean, or email, or, and everything that you do is very, very important. And the way that you do it is very, very important. So there's no rest. There is no rest. And there's no time to think. No, no time for discernment. OK, um, the last one I'm going to share with you tonight, and then we, I know we still have those two other questions we're going to come to, so bear with me. Um, the last topic I wanted to offer as a, um, another principle of how people can become indoctrinated is that of the sunken sunken cost. And it's a really big deal when we've invested so much in something. And there is a fascinating, truly fascinating study that I highly recommend for anybody who's into this stuff, which is this book, When Prophecy Fails. This is a book written by three researchers from the University of Minnesota back in 1956. They were studying social movements, and specifically social movements that had a failed prophecy. So they were 
had identified this as an area of study, and because there, of course, there are many examples of this throughout history, you know, where there's been a prophecy and it doesn't happen. Um, but they caught wind of the fact that there was a group active whose prophecy had not yet, the time had not yet come. So these three researchers infiltrated the group came and acted as true believers all the way through the night of the prophecy. And this particular group had a belief that there was an apocalyptic event that would happen and they would be rescued by beings from outer space. And it would happen at midnight on this particular day. So, these three researchers were actually in the room uh, and in the study groups all along leading up to it. I think they were in for several months before. I'm not exact, I can't remember how long. Um, and witnessed this, the strike of midnight and that big endless void of nothing. Do you remember Y2K, all the craze about Y2K? Yeah. I mean, I was wondering, you know, I wasn't that concerned, but I was curious, you know? So I've had a little taste of that um, in my own life. But that, like, sus the, that long suspended moment, and, and it's brilliant to read um, all the many different things that happened. There was only one person who, I think like 20 minutes later, silently got up and walked out the door, never to return to the group again. So that, there was only one who did that. Of course, the researchers were not going to do that, because they needed to know what happened. <laughs> and what, do you know what they found? It's just extraordinary. They, there was a whole new narrative that was created, that the leader, like, you know, oh, she started getting downloads. And I'm not going to go into the details, but um, with this new narrative, the group then formed even more strongly. So this unfulfilled prophecy actually strengthened the dang group. that apply to our understanding of how these dynamics happen. It's just fascinating, isn't it? Um, I was thinking terrifying, but fascinating is okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's terrifying, you know, just from this perspective, is that how any of those things are just this little bit more than what we experience on a daily basis. Exactly. In terms of marketing we're exposed to. Exactly. Memberships that we've been in that we're like, geez, I really should cancel that, but man, I've been in it for some time. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like minor little right. things that we don't get a second thought to. Right. But there's, like, we're, there's a tipping point somewhere, clearly. <laughs> there is definitely a tipping point, and it's a different tipping point for every single person. Yeah. You know, and that kind of leads us to the question, the third question of our evening, which is, you know, who's vulnerable? Mm. Um, to these kind of influences, the short answer is everyone. And the more specific answer is, you know, there certainly are times that are, um, that people are more vulnerable. So for example, adolescence into young adulthood, um, that's a massively vulnerable time because of all the changes that are taking place in the body and the psyche and the intellect but also because there's powerful um, recruitment that is totally targeted to this age group. The number of groups that target college campuses and watch out for teenagers is ginormous. I have a, um, I can't tell you how many people I know who were recruited on campus. And there's this one, this one woman um, I've worked with who came out of a fundamentalist um, religious group, uh, Christian group, 
went to college, got herself to college, was feeling set free from her family and that whole thing. Within six months, she had been, there had been four different attempts to recruit her into four different groups, all really different. And she found herself drawn to a Buddhist group. And it wasn't until years later that she realized, oh, when she finally got out of that group, that she realized that that group had exactly the same dynamics as, as what she had grown up in. And this is very common. It's very common. The whole campus stuff is a, is a really interesting phenomenon. The other thing to know is that um, Groups target, specifically try to recruit people who are smart, people of great intellect, because that will help the group. It boosts the, the esteem, it makes the group look, it gives credibility to the group when you have people who are you know, smart and celebrities, that's why a lot of celebrities are recruited. Um, and the other, the other time that people tend to be most vulnerable to um, falling into groups as, an, as adults um, is times of transition. So when there has been a death of a beloved or, or a birth. For me, it was the birth of my daughter. My daughter was six months old when I started. When I started working with my ex-teacher. Um, it can also be you know, a divorce. Any kind of major life transition makes someone vulnerable. And it's, I think it's important for us to know that, because that can, um, we can be at our friends' backs, in a way, if we're aware of that. And um, when they are getting you know, interested in getting involved in something, you can kind of query into it. Which brings us to our fourth and final question of the evening, um, which is, you know, why is it important to understand this stuff, and how can understanding these dynamics actually strengthen and build resilience in our communities? Um, I want to add another part to this question, which is, how does indoctrination get broken? How is it broken? Because that's very much related to this question. And one of the common threads that I've seen again and again with the clients that I have worked with is that um, the recognition of cruelty is often, often people get to a certain point where they reach a threshold that it can't be denied anymore. In my experience, I had witnessed plenty of harsh and cruel interactions that took place in the group I was in. But because I had put my leader on a pedestal and believed that when he was pushing people in what was you know, appear clearly a kind of an aggressive way, it was because he knew them really, really well, and that it was out of his deep love for them that he was pushing them. Like, that's what I sincerely believed. Mm -hmm. But when there was a crisis in the organization, and I finally got to hear one of my beloved friends and colleagues, I've been in this organization for 18 years, when I heard her describe in no uncertain terms how Doug, the, the leader of our group, would call her and berate her hour after hour after hour. And this is a woman who is a, a sensitive person who had a lot of trauma in her childhood, a poet, an artist, and I, when she described this, I knew unequivocally that she was telling the truth with a capital T. 
I could feel it in every cell in my body. And that experience of hearing about Doug's cruelty knocked Doug off that pedestal that I had him on. Well, it took a little while for that to happen, but um, it did happen quickly for me, but it created a cognitive dissonance. So the reality that I had constructed for myself and the narrative that I had adopted of who Doug was, was, was shaken profoundly. And it created the crack, the proverbial crack, that let in the light. And it was from that moment on, there was no going back. So recognizing his cruelty and this is a theme that I have experienced again and again with clients and writers who I work with. Um, the, the other thing that helps to break the indoctrination, I call these the, the four C's, um, compassion. Compassion is so important. We might want to debate people we might want to take a book and smack it over someone's head because they're just not thinking correctly. Aggression and debate don't work. In fact, they tend to drive people further in to the group. Compassion and kindness create these little fissures that also can let in the light. It's like the wall of indoctrination is very strong, and it's held tight by a kind of allegiance to the, to the, the group protocol that is imbued with a level of cruelty, with a level of control and harm. So gentle kindness can erode that wall and make fissures. The other very important thing is curiosity. Asking questions. If you have someone that you care about who is, you feel that their mind is hijacked, ask questions. Statements are probably alienating, but asking questions and clarifying questions Ask them about what they're involved in, and if they say something and you're not really sure what it is, or if they use a word that you know that doesn't quite fit with um, what they're describing, ask what they mean by it. Because every controlling group has a lingo. And there are words that are, that are used to kind of keep people in place. So understanding the language and being very curious about the language and what is taking place, again, that's another way of creating cracks in those fissures, uh, uh, fissures in, the, in the wall. And the last one is actually contemplation. Remember um, our Daniel Kahneman? Um, we have to we have to pause and consciously call on our slow thinking system. And in that pause, we have access to greater accuracy, more discernment, and our critical thinking. And that's where we actually, my friends, come back to my Uncle Joe's wisdom. Remember, his, you missed the popsicle. Sorry. That's good. <laughs> I'm glad I was here for the rest of the <laughs> He asked the question, um, what brings people into cults? Mm -hmm. and, um, and why do they do it? And wouldn't, why wouldn't a popsicle work as well? And really, when we have a popsicle, we have to really focus on it. Because there's going to be a mess if we don't really keep our attention on it. And that, that popsicle creates a little bit of a pause. And in that pause, before, if you're at all thinking about getting involved in 
saying signing up for another group, you can say, okay, have a popsicle, and then I'll decide. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you, Uncle Joe. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah.